Okay, let's start. Okay, so my name is Claudine, and um, I'm happy that you've joined us. I work at the WITS Centre for Deaf Studies and uh, have been at WITS now for almost 25 years. I'm a professor in Deaf Education, Deaf Studies, and Early Intervention. So, welcome to the session, and um, I think let's start with the, the topic, which is my child is deaf, my baby is deaf, what do I do now? And really, one of the first things we, we tell parents, and one of the first things I would say to you if you're a parent watching, is that to know that it's a journey, and you're going to get a lot of pressure from everywhere, you're going to get a lot of pressure from family, um, friends, people you've never met before, the doctors, all the people in the medical field. And there's just a lot of pressure happening. And it's it's interesting, there's more pressure once you find out that your, your baby or your child has a hearing loss than most other disabilities or barriers, even if temporary things happen. There's just this field of deafness and hearing loss that just has so much pressure that parents experience. So I think one of the first things I would say to, to parents is to stop, take time. And so if you are a professional and you work with parents or an interventionist um, or a medical practitioner, um, whatever I'm sharing with parents tonight is also for you to then think about from your side and how you work with families. But the first thing would be just for parents to just, just stop. Uh, you know, recognize and acknowledge that this is, is shocking, that there's just so much that you're going to have to deal with, but to really just put the pressure aside, if at all possible, and just take some time out. Um, this is the start of a long journey. No matter what you decide, no matter where you decide to go in terms of the choices and the the, the things you decide to do, places you decide to go, it's, it's going to be a long journey um, and it's one step at a time. So I would just normally say, let's take time out, let's stop. And sometimes parents will even say, we switch off the phones, um, we don't take uh, visitors, we, we don't take communication, we just kind of needed a time to cocoon in as a family. Um, and then just to say that over the past um, so I started High Hope's Early Intervention Program about 15 years ago, and over the last 15 years, we've worked with thousands and thousands of families. And so the information that I share is also from families that have shared with me. So the information is just from many years of experience in working with families. So when parents have said, we just want to cocoon ourselves, we just want to actually just shut the outside world off. And that's actually a very good idea if one's feeling overwhelmed. And it's okay to feel overwhelmed. And so to remind you that it's a journey, um, that it's always a good idea just to stop and say, I need time. Um, we need time to grieve. We need time just to think about it. And um, I'm going to start and then end right at the end with what I believe is the golden thread, the key. So I'm going to just show you a picture of a key. The key when you have a bubby with the hearing loss, whether the child is a tiny little baby or a child who's slightly older, um, there is no one way. There is no one answer that is going to meet the needs of your child. So initially it sounds a little bit scary because, you know, that might be overwhelming, but actually it is the most liberating thing for you as a parent that you can embrace. There is no one answer. There is no one way. There is no golden key that will help solve your specific child's answers. Um, no matter what professionals tell you, no matter what the medics tell you, there is no one way. And so another thing that, that kind of goes hand in hand with that is to follow your gut. Trust your gut and follow your gut. Obviously, when you're still new in the area, in the field, and you're still learning and you feel overwhelmed, you go, well, I don't have a gut feeling. And on the one side, that's possible, but you're a mom and you still know your bubby best. You're a dad, you're a primary caregiver, or you're a sibling. So you always have your gut and your heart to follow. And while you're learning and while you're exploring and while you inform yourself, 
you still also need to trust yourself. The next key thing for you to know is that it's not only there is no one answer and that you've got to follow your gut because you know your child best, but it's okay to change your mind. Because in every other field, when you try things out, you, you look at things, you try it out, so you can change your mind, you can look at it and adapt. And then, of course, your child is unique. So no matter how many deaf babies and families that I've worked with, over 15 years in early intervention and 25 years at the Center for Studies, every single baby is, I just wanted to check, no, no, my voice is on. Every single baby is unique. No matter if their hearing loss is the same as someone else's hearing loss, it's functionally and practically in the home, totally unique. And so although we take advice from others and we learn as much as we can to remember the key things, there is no one answer. There are many ways to choose from. Follow your gut and your heart. and Your child is unique. So that was just kind of the key things I wanted to throw out then. We'll, we'll talk about them at the end again. We've also just welcomed in a colleague from Tanzania. So welcome Dr. Mkama all the way from Tanzania. Um, so the, the top priority. So I've kind of got a list of the top priorities um, that I would share with a family if I was working with you or if I was working with you as someone who works with families as a professional medical practitioner um, and say, so what are the top priorities that you need to deal with and that you need to address if you have a family that you're working with or if you are the mom and dad that is saying, my baby is, has a hearing loss, what now? So one of the top priorities I would say is your family. So it's not just about the baby. It's not just about your little munchkin that's got a hearing loss. It's also about thinking, how are we as a family? So for me, I would say one of the top priorities is to focus on the well-being and health of your family. The diagnosis can be shocking. It can knock your feet out under you, rip the carpet out under you. Um, People talk about grief and all the various stages that people go through when they grieve. Um, one experiences many challenges and there's just so much that a family can deal with that sometimes um, it's really, really hard to just carry on with a normal life. Sometimes you'll fight more. Sometimes you'll be angry at each other. Sometimes you'll want to cry all the time. Sometimes one of your siblings is acting up, uh, the, one of your children, the sibling is acting up, fighting a lot, and you just don't understand why. And so going back to one of the key things is just to stop and say, what do we need as a family? So one of your top priorities is to focus on yourself as a family and recognizing that it's a big shock for everyone, and it's okay to grieve, and it's okay to really feel um, things are tough and to recognize that everyone grieves or feels shocked or is just dealing with this new um, diagnosis in different ways. So there might be five of you in the family and everyone is dealing with it in a different way and no one way is better. Some people scream and shout, some people just pull back, some people don't wanna eat, some people just don't wanna come home. They're going out all the time. And so, yeah, top priority you and your family and the, and, and the health of your family. Another priority would be to learn as much as you can. And that you can do, obviously people Google and they, they look around, but Dr. Google is not always the best place. So when you Google, um, it might be a good idea to also know which are respectable and um, responsible sites to visit to know where you can find good information. Ask questions. There is no question that is a dumb question. And um, what I would tend to do is, I, I would say to the families that I work with, is, you know, just to carry a little book around with you in your bag. And every time you think of a question, pop it down. Every time you think of an issue that you're worried about, pop it down. Because there's so much that we deal with when new things like this hit us that we forget a lot. So I just have my little book with me all the time and just jot them down, jot your questions down, jot your concerns down, and sometimes just dot down your feelings. Um, but particularly those questions as you're thinking them through for the next time you visit a doctor or the audiologist or your home interventionist. 
Um, OK, so Robin is just saying the audio is on the top right of your screen. And if you're unable to hear when you look at those three little dots on the top right hand side, you'll be able to put your audio up there. So if you're not able to hear, um, Robin and Nino are our technical gurus. So priority number one is really just thinking through you and your family and your family health. Um, if the grief is too much and you're just feeling too overwhelmed, reach out. There are psychologists and social workers and um, obviously your your pediatrician, your, um, your your audiologist, your ENT. And of course, there is an early intervention program called Ha Hopes, um, which is a free service. So reach out. Um, don't be scared to ask, but also don't be scared not to reach out if you just want to be quiet. Um, learning as much as you can, number two, is a slow process. Read as much as you can, ask as much as you can, join Facebook groups. There are many different Facebook groups for parents of children with, with, with hearing loss. Um, join groups that um, have deaf adults talking about hearing loss. And um, ask for information from your audiologist, from your ENT, from your pediatrician. Ask for information and um, ask for a lot of information, not just about what that one thing is that they're telling you. Ask for options. But I think one of the things we forget in this um, field, once you have a baby that has got a hearing loss um, diagnosed, and even as your child goes older, there's so much pressure from outside that, you know, what are the first things they're going to say is, are you going to sign or speak? Um, what school are you going to send your child to? And, oh, my word, are you going to have a cochlear implant or a hearing aid? And although all three of those questions are really, really important, your top priority is really about bonding with your baby, about um, making sure your child, your baby knows that you love them, that um, they feel comfortable in the home and that you're comfortable with your baby and knowing just how to deal and engage with them while um, you may be not sure about the hearing loss. But bonding is really an important part of focusing on the health of your family and yourself. Before we talk about language and amplification, we surely want to be thinking about another priority like communication. Communication is the building block, the foundation of language. But communication doesn't always need language. So for example, if I was standing in a foreign country, didn't know the language at all, whether it was a country that was using Roman numeral letters like um, ours or Chinese letters that, that, that are totally different from ours, I could communicate just with my face, just with a couple of gestures, without language. So, for example, if I was going, or if I'd be going, you know, that is communication. And the foundations of communication um, are really the most important things for your baby to develop and for you and your baby and your family and your baby to develop. And that can happen way before you decide on which language to use. So it's those communication skills, those building blocks of um, how to communicate with your child. And your home interventionist, your early interventionist, has a lot of information about building um, the foundations of communication. Um, because once communication is in place, then a child can really start flying in the language. The next thing for you as a top priority is to truly understand your baby's hearing loss. And so you've, you may have read a lot about hearing loss and audiograms, and um, you're learning as much as you can about the different amplification devices and, and surgeries, but it's now important for you to really learn about your baby and your child's hearing loss. And so to truly understand not just what does the audiogram mean, but what does that mean practically? So, for example, if the audiogram says there is a mild, moderate hearing loss kind of in the middle of the range, what does it actually sound like? What are they hearing? And so online, there are quite a few um, websites that you can go to to type in your baby's hearing loss on an audiogram and actually get a simulation of how your baby is hearing or what your baby is hearing. 
Now, obviously, it's a simulation, and it's not exactly, but it really is a good um, activity to do. So one really gets to see how much they can hear, and obviously, depending on the audiogram, that sometimes sound is is changed quite significantly and distorted. So if your child has a hearing loss, um, it's not just that the volume key is turned down. So it's not just that it's softer. Depending on the the the, the, the decibels and the, the frequencies that the bubby can and can't hear, those frequencies then obviously change the quality of the sound and not just the, the, the loudness, the amplification. And so understanding your child's hearing loss very specifically will also then help you to start making decisions about how to communicate, which language to use, what amplification devices there are. Um, and it'll also take you on your journey of just learning as much as you can. You're learning as much as you can about hearing loss, intervention, the therapies that are available, and what you can do in your location, in your country. Because although we've got a huge amount of um, choices available, what is happening in your area? So reach out. So for everyone that just got on the line, I spoke initially about what are the keys about when you say, oh, my word, I've got a baby with a hearing loss. Um, a family member of mine's got a baby with a hearing loss. Or I'm working with someone with a hearing loss. Some of the key things, that golden thread that goes throughout is there is no one way your baby is unique and follow your gut. And to again say, despite the fact that I'm a professor in deafness and have been in the field for um, almost 30 years, um, that no matter how much experience I have and how many babies I've met, every child is unique. Every hearing loss is unique. And sometimes things need to change and adapt and change again. There's not just one way that you stay on all the time. There is a very famous saying by um, a parent organization in the States called Hands and Voices. And Hands and Voices says, what works for your child is what makes the decision right. Ah, thank you. I ordered some water. Welcome if you've just joined us now. As Robin says, just jot down any questions you have in the, the chat section. So the top priorities are for number one, just to kind of stop and feel comfortable to say, I need to stop, I need to step back and I need to take time. To feel comfortable to work with your family in terms of your family health, bonding and relationships, establishing with your, your little bubby and um, Allow yourself to grieve. Allow your spouse and your children to grieve totally differently. There's no right way to grieve. Thinking through how I communicate with my child. It's not about the language only. And then once you're on the journey to go, so now how will I amplify? Many different hearing aids on the market. Many different makes. And some of them are better for babies than others. So when you see your audiologist, Ask them about the range of hearing aids. And you may trial them. You don't have to buy a hearing aid up front. You can test them out. You can trial them. There is also the surgery of the cochlear implant. If a child has a profound, a, 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 a strong enough hearing loss, if that makes sense, you've got to have a bad enough hearing loss to qualify for a cochlear implant surgery. Ask those questions. And then to remember that the language you use with, the, with your family needs to be thought through in terms of the language you use with your child because it's not a decision you make for your baby only. All the decisions you make about this baby with a hearing loss is going to impact on you and your family and the siblings and the grandparents. So think it through of what makes, what makes sense for the whole family. It needs to work for the whole family. So, for example, if you're an Afrikaans-speaking family, if you're a Klosa-speaking family, it may not be the best decision to only communicate with your deaf child in English. Even if we know that English is the language of the majority business sector, the, the language of literacy in South Africa, 
and the world. It needs to work for you and your family, for your baby and your family. And if Kosovo, Afrikaans, Zulu, whatever your home language is, that is uniquely linked to your culture. And if we somehow exclude our baby with a hearing loss, our child with a hearing loss from our home language, our mother tongue, we also then exclude them from understanding the cultural things, the heritage that your whole family brings to every event, every uh, family function, every celebration. And it's so important for your child to be involved in all of that, to really feel a part of your family. So what are the languages that you have available to you? Well, you've got spoken languages. You've got sound languages. You've got a mixture of both speaking and signing at the same time. Those are the language modalities. You've got additional cues and things that can help you. But for you to just, you know, am I going to be monolingual with my baby? Is she going to be monolingual? Or are we going to be bilingual or multilingual? And no matter what people tell you, when you have a child with a hearing loss, they can learn two languages. And so unless your baby has got additional challenges, um, and we would say if there are very many additional challenges, then we stick with one language and we slowly move over. But if your kitty is just deaf, just got a hearing loss, and your family is bilingual, and everyone around you is bilingual, then you can do it bilingually, but there are ways of doing it. And you can reach out and ask specialists to help you, and if you've got an early interventionist, they will help you. Just thinking through how does one implement a bilingual communication methodology in your home with your child. And then the last thing to talk about is what do you do now in terms of are you on your own? And to remind you that there is a whole team, there is a support team that can be built around you that can be there for you and your family and your specific questions and needs. And don't be shy to ask. Don't be shy to pull these people in as your team. So, for example, the first person in your team is typically going to be either your audiologist or your ear, nose and throat specialist or those two and your pediatrician because they would have probably helped you identify and diagnose the hearing loss or would have told you that there's potentially a problem that needs to be assessed. But those are the medical people, the therapeutic people in your team. But that's not enough. You also need to get to know other families, other parents with deaf babies, different levels of deafness, different ages of children, because only other parents truly know the journey you're walking. That's another thing to always remember. No matter how well trained people are, no matter what their qualifications and how much experience they have, when they go home at night, they don't have a deaf baby or a deaf child. And so no matter how correct we think we are when we're talking to you, that's why I said follow your gut. Because when you go home at night, you know what works and what doesn't. And even sometimes you may not even know what works, but you know what doesn't. And hey, that's a first step. If you know what doesn't work, you take it off the table or put it on hold. And so meeting other families is such an important thing um, for you as you have a, a child with a deafness or any other disability for that matter, reaching out to other families. Another wonderful person or part of your support team would be other deaf adults, other hard of hearing adults, people who've grown up with this thing called deafness, people who've grown up and experienced it and thrived and succeeded despite they are such important people that you want to engage with and ask questions to. Um, spend time with them. And if you, again, if you register with a home interventionist program like High Hopes, you will get access to um, deaf friends of various languages and communications, different types of amplification, but just meeting a whole lot of deaf people to find out how was it that they survived. For your little baby or child to see adults with hearing aids on, with cochlear implants on, using their hands or communicating differently with their with their mouths, their eyes. Another person that's part of your support team is your early interventionist. Now, an early interventionist is someone who knows babies, who knows um, child and baby development, all the milestones 
about when a baby does certain things cognitively in terms of language, how the body develops. And home interventionists particularly know the area of deafness and hearing loss and how that impacts on a young child and baby. In South Africa at the moment, um, we are only aware of one home interventionist program that is home-based, free of charge, and has no bias. In other words, they will come and sit alongside you, whether you're in public or private health, whether you want to sign or speak, or whether you want to sign and speak, and want to be open to change it if you want. They have no bias. And so that program is called High Hopes and Reach Out, because a home interventionist is then um, assigned to you for three years. You can walk alongside them once or twice a month. You can obviously, when your baby's small, it can be weekly. And sometimes you can say, I want a break. I'll contact you when I'm ready. But that person is going to be walking the journey with you with no judgment, just giving you information when you're ready to ask and giving you information, giving you contact details of other families with kids with deafness, but you have a support team that you can access around you. And if you're an interventionist or a therapist or medical practitioner working with families with deafness, never be scared to introduce them to other people in the field. Um, you won't lose them as customers or clients. You won't lose them as patients. In fact, when um, someone who works with families with deaf babies see that you are um, unselfish in sharing information, um, unselfish in sharing other specialists with them, um, other events with them, they then trust you more. If you don't know the answer, tell parents you don't know the answer. Um, parents tend to trust you when they see you don't always know. You don't always have to have the stiff upper lip and show them that you know everything um, because it's impossible to but that you acknowledge that you're going to walk alongside with the family and learn with them about their unique child. And so in closing, because it's a 30 minute chat and then open to you for questions, getting back to the three things was number one, it is a journey. And the golden rule in this journey is that you can stop and take time. It's one day at a time. The golden thread of there is no one answer. There is no one right way. Don't let anyone tell you that. That you've always got to follow your gut. You know your baby best. And that your child is unique. And you can change and adapt. You don't have to commit to any decision, to anything long term. None of us do in any other field. So that's the number one. The second thing we spoke about was priorities. What are the priorities? And of course, your priorities are your priorities. But with all that pressure from, you know, what language are you going to use? Are you going to have hearing aids and cochlear implants? And are you going to sign? Are you going to speak? All that pressure, your top priority is your mental health. You as the parent and your family. Focus on your family health. Your little bubby is part of that. But if you're not feeling good, if you're not coping, then your baby's not going to cope. So it's not about focusing on your baby first. It's focusing on yourself and making sure that you're fine, that you know how to access information, that you know where to go if you need um, to have, a, um, have some time to cry, that you know what to do, um, but focus on your family. Allow the siblings, allow your spouse to grieve in different ways, to shout and scream, if you want to shout and scream, sometimes we're angry with God, sometimes we're angry with doctors, sometimes we're angry at the baby, or we're angry at ourselves, we feel guilty. That's all normal. There's no right and wrong, but allow your family to um, feel the way they feel and find help to build and to, to um, try and heal and to start laughing again, slowly but surely, even if it's about something really small. The next priority is obviously you learn as much as you can. Google is not always the best place. It's a nice place to start, but learn as much as you can and don't only learn about the things that you're interested in. Learn about deafness. So the things you don't wanna know, 
you need to know about anyway. So you can truly say, I chose not to choose that because. And so to stay open minded, because your baby is going to challenge you, surprise you, shock you and push you out of your comfort zone. Just when you thought you knew about the hearing loss, which is the same as any parent of a teenager, any parent of any child. So there's no one way. Focus on bonding with your baby. It really is less about the language you use, whether you sign or speak, and initially more, does my baby know I love them? How do I communicate? How do I hold? How do I spend time with them, play with them? And then building the foundations of communication, which are separate from language. They're the foundations of, of, of communication that your um your audio, your audiologist, and very often those early auditory um, therapies, and of course your early interventionist will teach you the foundations of communication, which then then goes into so which language are we going to use, and then which language if we use Zulu or Xhosa or Afrikaans, are we going to speak that language or are we going to do sign language, are we only going to teach the child to read in that language and then just use South African sign language, are we going to use a combination? No choice is wrong. It's what works for your baby, but also what works for your family. And then, of course, going back to the fact that it's about your family's health. Look after yourself. Um, eat enough. Sleep enough. Make sure that you support the siblings. The siblings are often very um, take it really hard because they get forgotten. Um, and one of the one of the spouses, one of the parents, often is the one that is the doer, and the other one then is the the one doing all the background technical stuff, paying bills. And so keep communicating. And then finally, you have a team. <clears throat> the team around you and your family, not just the child. Because anyone who just works with a child is forgetting the key thing, the family. So you have a whole team that you can find around you. Your medical team, your audiologist, your pediatrician, your ENT, and as your child goes older, you'll probably have a speech and language therapist. In your, your social side, you'll have other families with deaf babies and deaf children. You'll have deaf adults, hard of hearing adults that you'll engage with. And then of course, you'll have your early interventionist, someone who comes in who has no bias. And because they don't charge a fee, there is no decision you make that can upset them. Um, because they've learned about everything, as well as continue to learn about everything. And that person is supposed to help you answer your questions, walk the path with you, um, give you all the information, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and tell you the truth. Um, but ultimately, it's about following your gut, trusting yourself, and knowing that in two, three months time, when you look back, you're going to be so much further along and know so much more. And ultimately, before the baby is six to seven months old, once you've been in the field for six, seven months with that baby, you are going to be the specialist of your baby and his hearing loss and what the family needs, no matter how much the specialists know. And then to kind of embrace that and be confident as you work with your team, because you know your baby best or you'll become to know your baby best as you work with them. And so that is the end of our very short half an hour webinar on my baby is a hearing loss, what now? Um, so whether you're a deaf person, a deaf adult, uh, a parent of a deaf child, uh, an interventionist, a therapist, medical practitioner, if you've got any questions, jot them down. Um, in the chat section, I'm looking at the chat section now, um, sometimes people are shy to chat, and that's also okay, but um, I can help answer some questions. And then, of course, if it's something you're interested in, we can have little chats more often. We've recorded this, so you can watch it again, or you can forward it to friends and colleagues. And definitely, if you're meeting families with have, which have deaf babies, you know, refer this to them. But most importantly, just let them know that there is help at hand. Any questions? You can turn your mic on if you want.
I am getting a candle because it's locked down here. And not locked down electricity. Okay, how reliable are hearing tests? That's a question from Marlon. Um, that's a really good, I'm so glad you asked that question, Marlon. Um, hearing tests, no matter when they're done, um, you know, in the science world, there is stuff we know about science and technology and all the machines that do the work, and then there's stuff we don't know. And if your doctor or your hearing specialist is truly honest with you, they will tell you there is the science and then there is the art. So there is stuff that we know about technology, but there is stuff we don't know about the ear yet. And so no matter what the tests are showing us, no one test can give you the full picture. And so it really is wonderful as your team works with you that they do various types of tests. So you're taking all these tests and they become different puzzle pieces in the puzzle that builds the full picture. So whether it's um, uh, the, the tympanogram that is gonna show you if there's fluid in the ear and how the sound is traveling through the ear, whether it's the AABR that the, the, they, they put on um, the little, can't think of the word right now. And so then they test the child's hearing and, and how the sound um, is, is taken up in the cochlea. Um, whether it's uh, a short little a screener that they do in hospital, the OAE, then they do behavioral when they send little sounds into the child's ears, a little pip or a little beep, and they observe the child to see if they move, if they're sucking, if they stop, if they, all of that together forms a big picture of your child's hearing loss, and it could change. Um, children's hearing um, can get worse. And sometimes children, while their brains are not yet fully developed, the auditory nerves can sometimes still develop and mature. And so depending on what the child's specific hearing loss is, it can and will change. Um, so that was 19 months. Um, it doesn't really matter about the age. Um, terrible twos, 18, 19 months to two is actually very, very hard to test a baby because they are so alert and so excited about things. Um, but if you find an audiologist who knows kids and babies, um, it really is um, worth finding the right one. So Kessa Naidu is asking, how best can one assist a parent who's in denial of accepting the hearing loss? Um, the only way that you can um, assist a family who's going through this is to know that you don't know. Um, you've never experienced it yourself unless you are another parent and then you've never experienced it exactly that way. So the way to really support families through this is to be available to answer their questions, give them information, to be patient and allow them to talk, allow them to share their frustrations and their questions. Um, and of course, dealing with grief, that kind of grief cycle, grief is a journey too. And um, it comes and goes. Um, some days are better than others. And it is cyclical. You know, every year at that one time, the day your, the diagnosis was made, you might have a wobbly and a bad day. Um, but every day is easier. But supporting a family is by being patient, giving them information, answering their questions, knowing when you don't know, um, and always knowing that no matter what, they are the ones of the deaf baby. So we don't really know what happens behind closed doors um, in the evenings. Um, any other questions? Thanks. I need lots. I'm now getting candles to shine on my face <laughs> as it gets darker. Um, please, can I have more? Any more questions? Kesa, did that answer your question? Marlon, did that answer your question? 
So while you're typing your, your questions, um, in South Africa, we've got a couple of family support groups. Um, one of the ones that I know best is an organization called Thrive. Um, Thrive is run by two amazing moms who started the program who've got deaf children. And Thrive is filled with families with children that are mildly deaf with a hard of hearing, right up to profoundly deaf, some sign, some speak, some do both, some have hearing aids, cochlear implants. Um, so definitely go and check out Thrive. Um, and then there is an international group called um, Hands and Voices. And I really suggest you connect um, get onto the group Hands and Voices because they've got so many resources to read about. And they were the ones that famously said, if it works for your child, that makes the decision right. So there is no one right choice for your child. There's no one way. There's no one answer. But if it works for you and your child, then it's working. Isabel, lovely presentation. Thank you so much. Yes, we'll tell you about the simulation websites. Um, the one that I can think of off, offhand is Oticon. Um, Oticon has a lovely simulation. And um, I actually think quite a few of the amplifications. So, you know, you could look at um, the Koch implant companies, um, Southern ENT and, and, and Medel, um, and of course the hearing aid companies. But what I've used most recently was on the Oticon website. Um, but you could also just literally type in simulation. Really nice. Um, but that in itself is hard. Because sometimes when you hear what your child can hear or can't hear for the first time, that can be a shock. And it's okay to feel terrible and it's okay to feel horrible. And it's just part of the journey. Any other questions? Well, we were planning for a 45-minute session from five until quarter to, quarter to six. Um, I'm a lecturer and want to teach the students. That's wonderful, Isabel. I think we should uh, connect. So um, at the end of the session, we will be loading this. Oh, here is our colleague from Iran. So we've had a colleague from Tanzania, and now we have a wonderful colleague from Iran. So welcome to our colleague from Iran, um, Dr. Gitta. Um, if you've got any other questions, guys, or what we will be doing is we will be uploading the, the recorded session for you. And um, if you visit the Ha Hopes Facebook, um, we'll have lots of um, opportunity to ask questions and um, obviously visit Thrive and Hands and Voices. And um, don't stop asking questions. Yes, there's the website for High Hopes. Um, any more questions? For all the home interventionists that are in training, um, very, very soon they will be graduating. And uh, High Hopes is interventionists all over the country in South Africa. Some of our areas obviously are not as well populated and uh, some of the provinces we haven't yet launched out into. There is our Facebook site. Thank you, Robin. Um, Robin is one of our um, support teams for the Deaf Friends. Robin has just finished her master's degree in anthropology. We have a deaf friend who has a PhD in deafness and deaf education. So the type of people that as parents can meet and just feel good about um, the future of their child is so important to engage with deaf people. Thanks, Isabel. Roma. Oh, that's amazing. Thanks, Roma. I'd love to meet with you. Reach out. Um, I'm typing in my cell phone number now. Anyone who'd like to send me a, a WhatsApp, I'm great on WhatsApp. And any mom with a deaf bubby, no matter how old they are, any dad with a deaf bubby, no matter they're young or small, you are in my family, you're in my inner circle, and you can WhatsApp me at any time. So I've just put up my cell phone number. If you're a parent of a deaf bubby, so Roma, please feel free to chat to me. And uh, much earlier, we had um, Sabrina, who's uh, a parent of a kiddie, 
please um, feel free to chat to me. Um, and then, of course, we've got amazing hearing kit that our sign is. We've got an email address that's been popped up, info at highhopes.co.za. And then, of course, we've got a platform where you can also um, Oh, there's a you can where you can um, find audiologists close to your area. We are almost ready to close. Someone's audio is on. Oh, Roma. your medical team and ask them why they didn't refer you because high hopes has been going for 15 years and when you do that in a place where now you're settled you're comfortable you're not angry you're not frustrated it will kind of make them go oh but we, we thought you were doing fine because sometimes they don't refer to high hopes because they think you're doing so fine they think oh my word you don't need support you look so comfortable you look so confident um and just to yeah i mean i think it, it, it's sometimes nice for parents when they're feeling comfortable and strong to go back to them and say, if only if you told me, I would have, you know, I wouldn't have had such a hard time or I wouldn't have felt so lost. So definitely ask them and challenge them because there are mommies and daddies sitting out there right now, Roma, where you were a year and a half ago and they might not know about us. So it, but thank yeah. you so much that you shared that. Yeah, well, thanks. Thanks so much. And now that we're here, um, I feel... Oh, I feel the purpose. Um, I know it sounds very profound, but I do is ever since my son a purpose, you know, to understand and um, and just make this more aware to the world. And stay in touch. And one day when he's married, invite us to the wedding. We are a lifetime partner with you on this journey. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks so okay. much. Hi, can I ask a question, please? Yes. All right. Um, my son is eight. He uses a hearing aid. And with the pandemic now, obviously mm. there's lots of mask wearing and things. So he's having a bit of difficulty with communicating with people um, who are busy wearing their masks. Um, and I'm finding that when he says, can you remove your mask? I'd like to see your mouth or or can you speak up? There's a reluctance. And now I'm finding that he's become a bit reclusive um, with wanting to play outside, with wanting to communicate with his friends. And he'll say to me, um, but I, I don't have friends at school because um, 
we can't speak without our masks on. And so when I can't hear them, mm. they, they're not prepared to remove the masks and rightfully so. Yeah. But I mean, how do I encourage him to just keep trying? I, it's, it's difficult when, when they eat. Yeah. Oh my word, I wish I could meet your son, but um, Sabrina, I'm going to tell you now. Number one, I think the fact that he's telling you that and he's asked before is fantastic. Number two, even when a kitty is hard of hearing and he's got really wonderful hearing aids, the lips are important. So yeah. I would go and speak to the school and I would challenge them, even if it's just for his class, to all get those special plastic ones. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a contact with that, that gets it straight from China. They get it the cheapest possible. Contact me and I'll let you know. Okay. And and then for him to be able to say it might be you saying, I am deaf. So this is might be a time when you might want to exaggerate. You can say to someone, I am deaf mm -hmm. and I can't hear you if I can't see your mouth. Please yeah. will you show them. Please will you lift it? Just mm -hmm. so you can say, just lift it briefly while you talk and then put it down. Yeah. Uh, and and to and not take it personally. Mm -hmm. um, and even if even if we had to sponsor five of those plastic masks and when you, he goes out and plays, take them to his friends. And when he's finished, take them back, take them back and clean them yourself. So you've got mm. five of them. Um, and Sabrina, welcome to the world of, of having a kitty with a hearing loss. You're going to have to be bold oh, and yes. talk to the principal, challenge them. This, all of those friends should have plastic masks. Mm -hmm. And then you'll see they're going to love it even more anyway. Because kids use their faces. It's not about deafness. Yes. They, they want to use their faces. So, and 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 just keep encouraging him. And now's the time for him to say, sorry, I'm deaf. So mm -hmm. part of hearing people don't understand. You can hear through hearing aid. We know you can. But mm -hmm. no matter how well you hear through hearing aid, the mask the is. The lip say is important. I'm sorry, yeah. I'm deaf. I can't hear you well enough. Please, could you lift your mask up like this? And then you put it down again. Or they're going to have to write it. But he's young, so reading is hard. But good for him. I'm mm -hmm. so proud of him. Thank you so much. Send us your address. We'll post. What is your son's name? Jody. Tell Jody we're so proud of him. We're going to send him a pack of books. All with right. Dead characters in. We're so proud of him. Thanks so much. Okay. Any more questions? We've heard from Sabrina and Rome. I'm so glad we um, moms have been chatting to us. So we're going to ask you guys to give us feedback. And any of you parents that have been online but just wanted to be quiet and felt comfortable just hearing, if you have a need to do more of these, chat more, have other questions that you want to ask and maybe have a half an hour session on a specific topic, please let us know. That is what High Hopes is there for. You've got our email address. Just send us a, a little WhatsApp, an email to say, at our next webinar for parents, please will you talk about this? That's what we're here for. And uh, thank you for joining us. And thank you for our international colleagues from Iran, Tanzania. And I think our colleague from Morocco was here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to our Mr. Sign English interpreter, Mr. Letlalo, our world famous interpreter, who's wonderful. Thank you for our, to our technical team, Robin who is a deaf woman who has got a master's in anthropology, just kind of saying these things so you know. If you've got a deaf bubby or a deaf child out there, the sky's the limit. They're going to achieve wonderful things and that we are here to help you every step of the way, walk with you, and if needed, sitting on the ground and crying with you. So thank you for joining us and have a wonderful evening. As you check out, you're welcome to type some Farewells and goodbyes. Put on your um, your video if you want to wave and say goodbye. Um, as we say goodbye. Hey, Gemma. <laughs> Gita from Iran. How are you, my friend? Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Saying goodbye to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Quasi. And Gita, maybe we can do this for um for your parents. Hey Mamelo. Thanks for joining us. 
Yes, thank you. Sure. <laughs> Thanks, Sabrina. Thanks, Roma, for joining us. Thanks, Percy. Obviously, Keller and Marie. Nino, our tech guy, thank you, thank you. 